We're going to talk tonight about what it means to be in Christ, in Christ Jesus. And friend, I'm going to tell you something. Hearing the gospel and receiving it is simple. And I'll just be honest with you, if you have an open heart, it's fast. It doesn't take very long to go from not knowing who Jesus is to knowing Him as your Savior and God as your Father. It really, I, I'm telling you, a person could have never heard of Jesus Christ, never heard the name of Jesus Christ, not know the story of creation, not know uh, about the virgin birth, not know about the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus. And go from a place of sheer ignorance to knowing the Lord in, in, in less than an hour. I mean, honestly, shorter than, than an hour. Most people have basic understanding of who God is, but there's enough in your heart about God that God put there. It's just a knowledge of Him, the nature of God, the Godhead, that you can just begin from creation and say, you know what, somebody made this world, and somebody made you, and go right to, right to the creation account of God and, and explain what Genesis 1-3 through 3 explained, where we came from and where sin came from and God's promise for sin. And then how the Jesus Christ came uh, of a virgin as prophesied in Genesis chapter 3 and that He came to die for sin. Why? Because we're sinners. Okay? And then you could explain uh, from there the cross of Jesus and the simplicity of salvation that Jesus illustrated in John chapter 3 when He said it's as simple as, as looking to the cross. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And it comes down to, he that believeth is not condemned. Or he that, he that, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed. And you could say to a person, listen, my friend, do you believe? And a person in their heart with the witness of the Holy Spirit, and he couldn't do that without the Holy Spirit, could you? I mean, a person, hey, listen, you were to tell me who God was, and I never heard who He was before. Uh, I'd have to think on it some, wouldn't you? When you have to think, just do a little research and find out and so forth. But I'm just telling you, with the Holy Spirit, you don't even have to have that. I mean, the Holy Spirit of God, while you're talking to somebody and sharing the Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God will be right inside of going like, this is true. And He'll just be grabbing that heart of theirs. And, and, and I've, I've shared the Gospel with people. I'm telling you, I've shared that. Just what I showed you, uh, just, just what we talked about just a minute ago. But I've gone through that with the person for the first time and at the end of that conversation said, now would you like to believe in Jesus? Oh yes, I would. <clears throat> and seeing people gloriously saved as a result of it. Believing the Gospel is very, very simple, my friend. And if a person gets saved simply believing, how saved are they? They're thoroughly saved, right? How long are they saved for? Forever. Forever. Okay. How much do they know? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, Nelson said nothing. They know as much as they need to, right? Uh, for where they're at. But how much room is there to grow? And how much is there to learn about your relationship with God? And about the awesome things that God has for us? I'm always, always, always thrilled about what the Apostle Paul talks about when he explains that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and explains how that the gospel that we preach to you, if Christ be not risen, then our faith is in vain. You're yet in your sins. Uh, we are, uh, we're become false witnesses. So where Paul said, hey, it's real, the gospel that we preach to you. It's, it's, it's majorly real, but it's also worth living. And it's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to realize that the spiritual blessings that we have for eternity are also intended for today. You know, some Christians get saved and they get caught up in a distraction. They get caught up in thinking of a couple things. They get, they get caught up thinking that we, we labor for the Lord Jesus for no reason. Now, I know no Christian would say there's no reason to live for Jesus. But sometimes they'll say things that indicate that that's what they think, even though they wouldn't say it. You know, they'll say, what's the use? You know, I can't, I can't, I can't make it, I can't do it, I can't, whatever, as though, as though there's no benefit in living for Jesus. Well, I'll tell you what the use is, what the reason of living for Jesus is, is it's the absolutely most wonderful thing in the world now. And not just in the future. Listen, my friend, you won't find something better than living your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. I was reading, and uh, uh, maybe I should just share this, I, I don't know. Maybe I can't find it here. I was reading in 1 Timothy today a passage of Scripture that I thought, man, that's thrilling about being a child of Christ. You don't have to turn there because I may not even find it. Um, 
I'm still just trying to introduce our, our thought this evening anyhow. <coughs> if I can't find it, we'll move on and I'll pretend I never said anything. And I don't remember it, so it won't matter as far as I'm concerned. I don't remember even pretending, so. I'm joking about that. I might remember. I can't find Timothy in my Bible. I don't remember where that's at. What's that? Uh, one of the verses. Timothy said we, we brought, no, or Paul said to Timothy, we brought nothing into this world. And it's certain we can carry nothing and out and having food and raiment, let us be. Uh, bear with content, he talks about. Um, okay, that, that verse, the verse I was thinking of, isn't it? In uh, verse cha chapter 2 and verse 12 of 2 Timothy, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And it's just a, just wonderful truths about God and his character and about the life that we live for the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't mean to mention that this evening. It was just something I was reading about um, and kind of, I guess, uh, made an impression in my mind. Anyway, let's let's move into our into our uh, text this evening. I want to talk about just a unique concept that is a truth for those who are in Jesus Christ. You ever feel as though you wish that the first covenant promises were for you? I'm talking about the promises God made to Israel. You ever feel as though, uh, for instance, I was reading in Deuteronomy some today. And I was reading in passages that talk about parents, fathers, uh, or just, just teaching your children and teaching your children things. One of the reminders in, uh, I think it's Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11. I better read it or I'll mess that up too. If I can't find it, I can always come up with it. But Deut I think it was Deuteronomy 11. Um, yeah, you shall teach them, in verse, uh, verse 19, you shall teach them your children Speaking of them, when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house, and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children, and the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of the heathen upon the earth. And if you were to read right before that, um, the Bible says in verse 16, Take heed to yourself that your heart be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and you shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not a fruit, unless you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. And uh, Moses is warning, of course, by, by God, the children of Israel, be careful you don't get off worshiping another god, because then all of a sudden you'll this land, this promises of the early and the latter rain and God's blessing on the land will go away. You know, it's, it's pretty incredible to realize the difference between the promised land then and now. Israel today, I'm told, I haven't physically been there, though I have seen pictures, Israel today is a, is a blooming, budding country. And a lot of what's done has been because of the development of bringing water, bringing in water. To, to Israel. You, you know, land that's a desert is sort of like out in Utah or Mormon country. I don't know if you've ever been out there where you're driving through the desert and all of a sudden there's these massive irrigation systems spraying these green fields. And so here you are driving driving through the desert and then all of a sudden you see, you know, out, just out, out west, you see these massive green fields that are, are very beautiful. And, and I've never been to Israel, but I assume in many ways that the irrigation that they've done in Israel has done the same thing there. But God promised Israel an early and a latter rain. He promised them a good hard rain before uh, when the crops are getting started and a good hard rain before the harvest. And they didn't have to do any irrigating for that. And that's pretty cool, isn't it? Could you imagine? Now, uh, Brother Charles and I were joking this week about rain. He's, he said, they said, yeah, I've got to put that aside because it's going to rain. Well, why does he know it's going to rain? Well, it's June and it's Florida. And it's pretty sure, I don't know if it rained at all today. And it may not be forecast the rest of this week, who knows. But it can rain in Florida, and it can come on down hard and fast this time of year, and you can get lots of water very, very quickly. Um, 
But could you imagine being from another country and going and, and maybe being uh, having some knowledge of skies and uh, bay, the climates and so forth, and going to Israel and somebody saying, "Well, it's about time to rain." And you're looking out and you're thinking of the season of the year, the region of the country, and the climate and so forth, and thinking there ain't a chance, ain't a prayer in the world it's going to rain. And yet, it rains. And the reason that people know it's going to rain is not because you know, they're, uh, you know, they have some kind of geothermal knowledge or they have some kind of, um, uh, what do you call it? What's the... What's the What's the weather guys call? We call them idiots. Meteorology. Meteorology. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, uh, you, because you're a meteorologist, the reason you know it's going to rain is because God said it would. And so you can plant your harvest with confidence. And when you plant your harvest, you know that it's going to be so plentiful that you, when you're when you're rounding a corner and you're cutting, you know, you're cutting down your grain or whatever it is. When you round a corner, you don't cut the corner. When you go to shake your fig trees to get the figs off and you got your nets laid on the ground, you shake them once, but any of the figs that stay on, you leave them there. And the reason you leave them there is because that's provision for people that don't have anything and they're allowed to come and glean. If something, if you're gleaning and you, grain, you drop a handful of grain on the field, you leave it. And the reason you leave it is because people that don't have land and don't have, uh, don't have crops, that's, that's for them to come. And that's really God's blessing when you have enough to when when you're well enough off that you don't have to take everything that you can just leave it behind so somebody else can have it and take care of the poor. That's a real blessing, isn't it? And so God told the children of Israel, He said, "I want you to do something. I want you uh, to be faithful to me and not worship idols. And I promise you, it'll always rain, and you'll always have great crops, and everything will just be hunky dory and go just fine." Now, if you're a farmer, and I, uh, I grew up a you know, farmer kid. If you're a farmer, that's pretty amazing. Uh, we almost always, my God always just blessed my granddad. He had good land, and he always had good crops. He almost always blessed us with good crops. But I remember one year when our wheat was so bad we didn't cut it. It just wasn't worth it. You, it wouldn't pay for the fuel to harvest it. And it was just terrible. And I remember just, just uh, having a real bad harvest. And um, I remember some years having a real plentiful harvest, and some years not having too good of a harvest. And I'll tell you what, that's going to throw you off for a couple years financially. That's your living. A lot of things, you know, if you have a bad, you don't have, well, if you could imagine, if you just, you know, cancel your income for a year, uh, but, but have more expenses as a result of it. And that's what it's like when you farm and you don't have a good harvest. It costs you more, but you make less. You don't make anything. And so here you have an agricultural society like Israel, and God told them, He said, if you'll honor me, you'll always have a good harvest. That's a pretty good guarantee. But God wanted to teach their children. Well, that's a promise to Israel, isn't it? Is there anything in the bylaws of the United States of America where God has spoken or a voice from the sky has come down and said, you know, if you honor me, now we know, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, right? We know the righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is the reproach of any people. We know these things. These things are true. And they're principles that we can live by, but they're not to us. They're, they, they're, most of the principles uh, that we quote and we know are actually to Israel. And it's pretty special to be a Jew. And sometimes, <laughs> as a believer in Jesus, sometimes I feel inferior. I feel as though you ever meet a, a guy who's saved and he's Jewish and it's all he wants to talk about is Israel, 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 and Jewish and, and the yada, yada, yada. Sometimes I'll tell you that could just get you, get under your skin. Get a little annoying sometimes because you almost feel like, man, do they think they're better than everybody else? And you look at the covenant promises and you think, well, they have covenant promises that aren't to me. So they are better. God's made promises to Israel that He hasn't made to me. And so... When Gentiles began to be saved and began to be part of the church, the Jews wanted to come in to the church, the Judaizers, I should say, the Pharisees, the same ones that got up and um, the Bible said to, you know, they disputed with Saul and Barnabas. Uh, they got up in, in the Jerusalem church, the sect of the Pharisees that believed. Verse 5 says, 
saying that it was needful to circumcise them to command them to keep the law of Moses. They said, listen, they don't get to have the benefits of being a Jew without having the work. They're going to have to keep the law if they want to be Jewish. And so the apostles and the elders came together. Peter stood up and he shared his testimony about how that God commanded him to eat unclean things. And he said, not so, Lord, no unclean thing hath ever touched my lips. But God was showing him that the Gentiles would be saved. So Peter testified. And of course the apostles testified. Paul and Barnabas, uh, they testified of what had happened in Antioch. And that the Gentiles had gotten saved and the Holy Spirit was living in them. So there's this big debate in the church. Do the Gentiles have to live like Jews in order to go to heaven? Well, the Bible says in verse 12, this is after Peter told them about it, then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Now, isn't this amazing? They're having This is the church at Jerusalem, and they're having this discussion. It's pretty lively. They start off by giving reasons why these guys, if we had to keep the law, these guys ought to have to keep the law too. And uh, they may be Gentiles, but Jesus is a Jew, and if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to have to act like a Jew. You're going to have to get circumcised, you have to keep all the law, we're doing it, and they should too. And then Peter got up and said, well, that isn't really how the Gospel was presented to me when the Lord sent me to share it. And Paul and Barnabas got up and said, well, I'll tell you something about these Gentiles who've never kept the law. They're just as gloriously saved as you are and I am. And the Holy Spirit's speaking and working in them, and God's doing amazing things. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you something, folks. Antioch's a life church. And nobody really had much to say about that. The Bible said they all kept silence and gave audience. James, a leader in the church there, and he gets up and he makes this declaration or this statement, and he preaches a little sermon in the middle. He preaches from Amos and uh, chapter 9. He said this, he said in verse second part of verse 13, he said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. He said, listen up, guys. Simeon hath declared, Simeon here is Simon. It's another word or name for Simon Peter. And he said, Simeon hath declared how, at first, how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And he said, to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. And he quotes here Amos chapter 9. He, he says, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. He said, you know what? This is prophesied. Uh, and then verse 17, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Well, let's read Amos Real, really quickly, if you don't mind, if you'll find in your Bible, it's Hosea, Joel, Amos, before Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Uh, Amos, and if you'll find, <clears throat> excuse me, find chapter 9. I'm going to read verse 11. This is the scripture that James is quoting. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle. This is speaking of the millennial reign of Christ, by the way, folks. Uh, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name. Did you see that next statement? The heathen, the Bible says what? Which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. And so oh, uh, Amos indicates that the heathen one day will be called by the name of the Lord, and this is when he's setting up the tabernacle of David. So this is the this is the millennial. Where's the tabernacle of David today, folks? Anybody know where that's at? You don't know where it is because it hasn't happened yet. But when Jesus Christ comes to rule and reign, He's going to set up that tabernacle. Now understand that James knows that he's not in the millennium. He knows that the tabernacle of David isn't set up. What he's saying and what he says in verse 18: Known unto God are all His works from the beginning of the world. In other words. This is God's plan. This has been God's plan. This will be God's plan. God's plan has always been for the Gentiles to be saved. So James points out, he said, Amos says it's going to happen in the millennium. It's happening now. It's consistent with the Scripture that God saves all men. But friend, I want to point out one last thing, and I think that's encouraging. First of all, I want us to know, I want to make sure that I state it as plainly as I can, there's no superiority of Jews and Greeks. 
In another place, Paul expounds this, and he's explaining it to the church at Galatia, who has had Judaizers come in and try to accomplish the same things which were tried to accomplish in Antioch, which is to convert them into keeping the law. When those that needed the law, uh, those that were under the law never kept it themselves and had to come to Christ through believing of faith. Okay, I'm making one last point where we'll be done. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Now it talks about our law being our schoolmaster that showed us that we needed Christ. In other words, it, was, it helped us to understand that we were sold under sin. But verse 25, the Bible says, well, let me read verse 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified. What are the words for justification there? Behind it? Two words. That we might be justified. That we might be. Anybody in verse 24? The second part of verse 24? Is anybody there yet? Is anybody here? Galatians chapter 3. Yeah, you're there, baby? I just can't hear you. You got to holler if you want to communicate with me. I got a sound system. Okay, by faith, she said it. By faith. That we might be justified by faith. Now, I understand and know this. This is Apostle Paul speaking. The we here is inclusive, and he's talking about himself, who is a devoted Jew and a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he said, We were justified by faith. He's speaking to the Jews and helping them to understand that the law was their schoolmaster so that they would know that they, it would bring them to Christ in order that they would be justified. How? By faith. Has anyone ever been justified by the law? No. Has anyone ever been condemned by the law? Has anyone ever lived under the law? Yes. You can live under the law, my friend, but you can't be justified by it. You'll never measure up to God's law. can't be done. All it shows you is that you need Jesus Christ. It shows the person who's under it, and it shows the person who's not under it. So if you look at a Gentile and say, well, he's not under the law, and you look at a Jew and say he's under the law, both of them need to be justified by faith in Jesus Christ. But those that are on the law, under the law understand, hey, this just shows me that I need Jesus. Verse 25, after that, the faith, after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now that's kind of nice, isn't it? School's out, teacher's out. All right, what is it? School's out. Teacher let the donkeys out. One went in, one went out, all that. Whatever statements, some good, some bad. Um, I'll tell you something, I always hated school. I've done plenty of it just to find out for sure if I hated it or not. And uh, I did. Um, I, don't know, I don't mind learning, but I'll tell you what, education's a hardship. Teachers are just, they're, they're just born mean. They're just mean people. My wife's back there like, hey, wait a second. I never had teachers like people. I had that people liked like my wife. I had nice teachers, but I never had teachers that you know you really liked. I don't know why. But I had teachers I respected. I had good teachers. I always hated school. So when the, when the Bible says here we are no longer under a schoolmaster, I want to jump up and shout. You know, I want to be like, it's the last day of school. I'm out of here. And uh, I may not come back unless y'all get lucky, you know, or something like that. Okay. You are all the children of God by the faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 26. Did you just read that with me? Did you, did you see what I read? For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You ever sing Father Abraham? Father Abraham. That man, I'm going to make you sing it if y'all don't get lively looking here real quick. Many sons, many sons had Father Abraham and I am one of them and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord right and Father Abraham. I'm going to get in trouble here. I don't have enough words. Many sons said, Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord right and left and Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons said, Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord right and left our right foot. Father Abraham is part. Many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And I am one of them. And so are you. So let's just praise the Lord right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot. Father Abraham. Has it in somewhere? How far does this go? 
Oh, you gotta turn around. All right, let's do right arm left. Right arm, right arm left, arm right foot, left foot. Shake your head. Right, shake your head. Turn around. Sit down. Okay. That'd be all right. Okay. So now, I've had people tell me, "Well, Pastor Price, we're not Jews." We're all singing, Father Abraham had many sons, and I'm one of them, and so are you. Well, we're not Jews. We're not Father Abraham's sons. Well, I read Galatians chapter 3 one time, and what it said was that ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, you say Abraham's children? Well, the Bible says in verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And friend, I'm just as good a Jew as Jesus was. In other words, my Jewishness is not my lineage. My Jewishness is being covered by Jewish blood. And it's His lineage. And Jesus is just about as good a Jew as you could get. Is that the understatement of the millennium? Jesus is the only Jew who ever kept the law. Jesus is the only Jew who never sinned. Jesus is the only one who was able to say, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And if in Jesus Christ, I'm Abraham's child, what am I? I'm Jewish. You know, heaven's not going to be a confusing place. It's not going to be people. So what dispensation did you come to God in? pre-Christ, you know, uh, were you, were you, uh, what do they call it, innocence, age of innocence? No, nobody got to heaven in the age of innocence. They all came out of that pretty badly, didn't they? You know, are you after the fall, the Adamic fall? Are you, uh, you know, are you Israel? Are you pre-Israel? Are you part of the church? No, my friend, anybody who's in heaven is in heaven because of Jesus Christ, faith of Jesus Christ, whether looking forward to what Christ would do or of looking to what Christ has done. And what we are before God is what Jesus is, which is the only perfect Jew who ever lived. And I just think it's one of those things that, hey, I can get saved not ever know that I'm a child of Abraham, but it's pretty cool to know. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That was pretty pretty good timing there. Shanice, you got to quit that. <laughs> and that's what I want to share with you guys tonight, is something to help us to think and understand what we are in Jesus Christ. And I think it's vitally important for us to know your position, know what you are in Jesus. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Hey, listen. Well, you know what? I believe Jesus, and so I'm better than a Jew. Well, no, you believe Jesus, and so you benefited from the Jew. Um, I'm Jewish, and so I'm better than a Gentile. Well, no Jew ever kept the law, only Jesus. And if you're in Christ, you're Christ's. And that's the highest standard. That's the best that you are. And anyone who's the same is just the same, isn't it? It's really interesting this past Sunday night. You know, the NBA's rigged. Andrew told me that at the beginning of the season, and he proved it this year. But this past Sunday night, the basketball team that won more games in a season than any team ever has before lost the championship. And a team that probably would have been about third ranking behind the two teams in the West won the championship. And it's interesting, though, if you make it into the playoffs, all you got to do to advance is win. It don't matter if somebody had a better record that you're playing, all you have to do is win. And it doesn't matter if somebody's got more skill or more talent or won more games, all you got to do is win. And that analogy does fall sort of short, but the reality of it is is that, you know, Cleveland Platt Cavaliers last week were down uh, three games to one. And nobody has ever come back from that before, but all they had to do was win three games. <coughs> they did. And you know something, you're not maybe born Jewish, maybe you're a sinner. Maybe you're Jewish, but you've not kept the law. It might be that somebody you knew got saved earlier in life and lived better than you did before you came to Christ. It might be 
uh, that neither you nor that person came to Christ, but one person made better life choices than you did up to that point. Well, I'll just tell you something, friend. When you receive Jesus, you're in. And you won. And your record really doesn't mean anything at all. It's whether or not you have received by faith the most important thing. It's what you are. Wherein you stand. There are a lot of people that have done the same thing the difficult way and folks that have done the same thing the easy way. And I'm not talking about salvation. I'm just talking about things in general. I know guys that went to school for years to take tests to pass for their ASC certification to be automotive mechanics. And now other guys that went and took the test without going to school and passed the test. The guy that passed the test gets the same certification whether you had schooling in it or you didn't. You understand what I'm saying? So whether you come to Christ and you were under the law or you come to Christ without the law, if you come to Jesus by faith in Christ, you're what Jesus is and that's as good as it gets. And that's a wonderful truth and I hope that you will take it home with you and you'll live it out in your lives and you'll realize, hey, we don't have, you know, these people have a heritage. Well, praise the Lord for your heritage, but I've got Jesus' heritage. And if that's what you've got, we're the same. I'm not better, you're not better. Jesus is the best and that's what we got. And I think it's a wonderful truth that encourages my heart and hope it blesses yours this week as well. Father, thank You for what You've taught us this evening from Your Word. And I just thank You so much for the position in Jesus Christ. The confidence that we can live by knowing our standing, our position, it isn't because we've kept the law. It isn't because... Uh, we were fortunate enough to be born in a certain place or with, uh, in a certain home or a certain lineage, but that it really has to do with what Jesus did, which was better than anything we could imagine. And we had His position, His place. Lord, I pray that Jesus would be the thing that we're most proud of. It would be the thing that we glory the most in is the cross of Jesus Christ. We thank You for it in His name. Well, let's take some prayer requests this evening. Shall we do that? Anybody warm?